Hi, everybody. My name is Greg Katz, and welcome to Tuesday's edition of WeRSE.com's Inside the Trojans Huddle, where we tell it like it is. Friends, Inside the Trojans Huddle is a game like panel discussion that is posted each Tuesday during the season. Huddle features WeRSC columnists, staff writers, and historians. We first start off with the pregame show where we introduce our panel members for this edition of Inside the Trojans Huddle. Let's meet Tuesday's panelists. A WeRSC columnist who writes WeRSC.com's The Monday Morass, Yay or Nay, and Sunday Takeaways, in addition to regular season football and basketball reports. He also hosts his own podcast show entitled Locked On USC. That's Mark Culkin, the editor-in-chief of WeRSC.com, columnist, national recruiting guru, producer, and moderator of WeRSC's Four Downs and Five Things video shows, a graduate of USC. That's Eric McKinney and a former William Jewell College defensive back, we are SC columnist who writes the popular column, Musings with Arledge, and Musings with Arledge solo edition, a graduate of the USC Law School, that's Chris Arledge, and a weekly WeRSC.com columnist who writes Fridays, the obvious, not so obvious, IMHO Sunday, WeRSC.com's travel guide and an active member of the Football Writers Association of America, your moderator and producer of Inside the Trojan Subtle, Greg Katz. Folks, if you enjoy WeRSC.com's Inside the Trojans Huddle, we thank you and strongly encourage those of you watching on sites like YouTube, click on the like and red subscriber buttons. It's greatly valued, appreciated, and it is free. You can also listen to Inside the Trojans Huddle on most available podcast sites. And friends, speaking of WeRSC.com, we're offering first-time subscribers unlimited premium access for just $1 for one month. If you're not already a full-time premium subscriber, you won't want to miss the USC football website that really does. Tell it like it is. All right. Let's kick off the first quarter of Inside the Trojans Huddle by immediately taking a look at number five USC Saturday night's Pac-12 opponent, the Arizona State Sun Devils in Tempe, Arizona. Fox will televise the game, which will kick off at 7.30 p.m. ASU is under first-year head coach Kenny Dillingham. He's a former Oregon Ducks offensive coordinator. He's gotten off to a rough start at one and two with all three games having been played at ASU's home, Mountain America Stadium, formerly known as Sun Devil Stadium. This past weekend, the Sun Devils were shut out by Fresno State 29 to nothing. The ASU quarterbacking situation for USC is in a world of hurt. Freshman starter Jaden Rashada, who started ASU's first two games, is out for at least a month with an undisclosed injury. Notre Dame transfer quarterback Drew Pine who started quarterback for the Irish last season against the Trojans, suffered a leg injury against Fresno State. And Trenton Bruget, who started for ASU last season against USC, suffered a foot injury. His status is yet to be determined. And to compete against the Trojans, ASU may have to go and rely on sophomore signal caller Jacob Conover. Defensively, ASU returns five starters, led by redshirt freshman linebacker Tate Romney and senior safeties Chris Edmonds and Shamari Simmons. So there you got it. Uh, further note here, uh, ASU is currently averaging 13 points a game on offense, allowing 25.7 points per game on defense. And that's what you need to know. Panel, the Trojans opened up a 31 and a half point favorite to crush ASU. What will you be looking for from the Trojans offense and defense against the Sun Devils? Let's lead off with Mark Culkin. Yeah, I'm hoping this game is over in an hour and a half. I, I know that'll be difficult, but I, I don't like feeling sorry for, for the opponent, but I literally feel sorry for Arizona State. When you're down to your what, fourth string quarterback and you've already had your, you know, your heart kind of ripped out from you beginning of the season when you find out that even though you're probably not going to go to a bowl game, your own administration is going to tell you you can't go to a bowl game. This team, once it's, I don't know, 21 nothing after five minutes. I don't know how motivated Arizona State's going to be. What I would like to see from USC is this. Get in, get out as quickly as possible. Look good. Don't get hurt. Both sides of the ball. Just keep getting better. And let's look forward to Colorado a week later. This, everyone thought that, you know, Stanford was going to be the worst team in the conference. Arizona State, I don't know if you can get lower than they are right now. I mean, Eddie Chaplisky is probably going, I got out of there in just the right time because, I don't know, you've got a 30-something-year-old head coach that barely looks like he's old enough to shave. 
he looks scared, confused, not from knowing what to do with this team right now. Lincoln Riley can lay 70 or he can lay 60 and do it spread out. And we're, we're going to see what happens in this game. I, this could be ugly. It could get real ugly real fast. Eric, how ugly will it be? Well, it won't be ugly for USC fans, I don't right. think. I mean, I, I think for, for this one, you're looking for perfection, right, from from both sides. Uh, Josh Hansen, the offensive line coach, last week said that was the first game where the USC offensive line didn't cause a drive to kind of go off the rails. I think this week you're looking for every position group offensively to get it done, right? Nobody's dropping balls. Nobody is missing blocks. Um, this is a team where if you're USC, you want to show like you can go on the road, you can stay dialed in, you can be focused, you can come out strong and, and you can do what you need to do uh, offensively. This team has already shown that they can do that, that they come, can come out on the gas, take their first drive for a touchdown and, and be that good offensively early on. It's it's remarkable how this early stretch of games just keeps going. You, you're waiting for USC to play its first game of the season. You you knew the second half. You knew the schedule was backloaded. You knew that the first games were not going to really test USC. You thought w- with a quarterback like Jaden Rashada, who, yes, he's a true freshman, but there is some talent there. Arizona State has some linemen and, and all of that. They're all hurt. None of them played. They're all, I mean, it's, it's when does the USC season start? You're looking ahead to, to Colorado, who's probably without Travis Hunter. It just goes on and on week after week where you're not really getting tested. So, again, perfection. It's It's USC against itself. How good can they play? How well can they lock in and just go and and like Mark said, it's it's a business meeting. Go get your stuff done and and get back to LA. Chris Arledge. I've been eagerly awaiting this um Caleb Williams, Jacob Conover gunslinging duel. I've been thinking about it all offseason. I mean I understand a- ASU is only averaging 13 points a game against generally horrific competition. But if they could, if they could say quadruple that, then they could probably lose by 10. This is a stupid game, right? It's not, it's nobody's fault that it's a stupid game. I mean, maybe it's Herm Edwards' fault that it's a stupid game, but nobody else is to blame for this. It's a conference opponent. You have to play them. But a team that just got shut out at home by Fresno State, was it 31 to nothing, 29 nothing? 29 nothing. Okay. Yeah, I don't think we have to spend a lot of time analyzing this one. Uh, it's going to be a, every bit as ugly as USC wants it to be. The Trojans could play like garbage and win by 40. I hope they don't, but they could. That's all I have to say about this, as Forrest Gump might put it. Thank you. Well said. Um, there's not much to add. I think all three of you pretty much hit all the – all the buttons, it's, um, you know, uh, of course, I guess you could say maybe it's at least it's a 730 game and not a nine o'clock game. Like we've been informed that the Colorado kickoff will be uh, Pacific time. Uh, I don't know. what. Would you rather have a 730 game at night against Arizona State or nine o'clock in the morning game uh, against Colorado? Uh, I, I tell you, the 730 games are starting to look a lot better because I'm afraid this nine o'clock uh pacific coast time uh when i look at the future of sc in the in the big 10 i if fox is going to do that that, that's just going to be a travesty in my opinion but that's a discussion for another time all right let's turn to some more positive things if we can for arizona state we know after this season arizona state is heading for the big 12 sc is going to the big 10 that being said, what are your favorite memories, good or bad, of the USC ASU rivalry, Mark? So I had a good and bad memory on the same games. And then I'll get to the really bad. Well, depends how you look at it. The uh, 2005 game, USC at Arizona State in September at 1230 in the afternoon. 
is probably the one of the worst decisions that the TV networks ever made. Now, not only did they run out of bottled water before halftime, and it was a hundred and something plus degrees outside, you've got USC losing. And then all of a sudden, you know, Matt Leinert isn't coming out, but Lendale White's doing what he needs to do. Matt Matt Leinert eventually shows himself like, um, what was it, Walt Frazier from the Knicks kind of pulling his leg out there and coming out on the field. USC comes back and wins the game. So that was good, bad, and really grossly disgusting hot that day. But I was also at the Arizona State game when uh, – well, when Lane Kiffin got home, he got tarmac. And I remember sitting up in the stands and I looked at my buddy and said, who is just ripping Pat Hayden's ear off right now on the sideline? I mean, I had never seen USC's athletic director do this before. I, that's You had players on the team that were shifting down the sideline because that's how comfortable it was. We later found out that evening what was going on. Um, yeah, so a lot of interesting stuff in, in Temp happens in Tempe with USC. <laughs> Those are some good good memories, one way or the other. They're still good memories. Uh, Eric, the 2005 second half is the the one that jumps out. Um, the Drake London touchdown catch in the the weirdest USC game that I've been to. It was it was the the first game of that 2020 season where there's nobody in the stands. We're in the press box. You're kind of figuring out how this season's going to go and what it feels like with with nobody in the stands. I uh, for, from our view and because there's no reaction had no idea he caught that ball until he's standing up and celebrating. I mean, seconds after he, after he caught it, that catch and and really the finish of that game, the weird brew McCoy touchdown catch that got batted, the onside kick uh, recovery. And then that, that fourth and nine, again, the, the touchdown there. I mean, it ultimately that game means nothing. I mean, the, the 2005 game and what that did and, and kind of that season is obviously bigger. Um, but that that 2020 game, that that finish was wild. If you put that in a regular season with a with a big crowd there as kind of the opener um, for that one, I, I think that gets remembered a little bit more. The 2014, I mean, I'm, you know, Mark obviously mentioned the the you know Kiffin's last game and all of that, but the 2014 home game, the the jail Mary um, that jail, Arizona State won is is gross that's a, that's a gross one i mean <laughs> one of the one of the worst word. endings again in a in a game that doesn't mean a whole lot in terms of a, a national or historical um sense but i gotta go back arizona state fresno state this last game we're talking about this arizona state team that might be my my favorite arizona state's first half offensive showing they did not punt Got shut out and did not punt in the first half. I don't know how, how many people followed this specifically. Interception, fumble, fumble, turnover on downs, interception. They punted to start the second half. So got off to a good start there. Then went interception, fumble. They turned the, the ball over eight times in that game. I honestly can't get over how, how bad that team looks right now it's it's unbelievable so maybe it's we'll have you know may, maybe we'll see usc set kind of it's it's all time uh points record in this and and this 2023 version will be will be something to remember in the series chris that's why eddie c left because of that right there people say why would you go to usc they never punt you could stay at arizona state punt all the time he says no i'll never get to punt there the problem with these the problem with these questions when it comes to programs like Arizona State, which has occasionally had a good football team, right? I mean, you had the you had the game of what ninety six maybe, which was which was an Arizona State team that went to the uh, to the Rose Bowl and and USC with Brad Otten lost in you know maybe double overtime. I mean, there have been some losses to good ASU teams. The problem is. Like, if you ask me memories of Notre Dame, UCLA, Washington, Oregon, like the better programs, 
I can think of all kinds of great wins that stand out in my mind and make me happy. If you ask me the things I remember about the Arizona schools, the only thing I can tell you are the horrible moments. I've never been all that excited about a win over Arizona State. They're nice to have because they beat the alternative. But I've never, it's not, it's not like I've ever left saying, I'll never forget this win over the Sun Devils. That doesn't happen if you're a USC fan. What happens if you're a USC fan is that 2014 game that Eric mentioned, right? I mean, this was the epitome of, of what I knew was going to happen when they hired Steve Sarkeesian. By the way, Texas fans, I know you're not paying attention to this, but if one or two of you are, I know you're excited. I know you beat the worst Alabama team in 15 years, and I know you think things are okay. They're not. You just wait. You have nobody on your schedule. You have t- you have Alabama and OU. That's all you have. TCU's terrible. Baylor's terrible. Kansas State's terrible. Everybody in your schedule is terrible. He will still find a way to lose at least two because he's awful. That was the definition. Remember, we had the nice win against Stanford. I know I'm getting away from ASU. I've already told you I don't care about ASU. We had that nice win against Stanford. Everybody thought, okay, this we're going to be all right. Then the absolute beat down to Boston College where they ran for 37 yards a carry for the entire game. And then two weeks later, you have a two-score lead against Arizona State in the Coliseum. You give up a 73-yard pass to a running back, go three and out, and then go up a Hail Mary where the poor linebacker, the middle linebacker who's – for whatever reason, we decided that our middle linebacker should be back in the end zone trying to bat down the ball because, of course, and he stands there and waits for the – he tries to attack the ball at its lowest point and the receiver – it was just – there was nothing about that game that wasn't horrible. And, and it was the epitome of what it's like to have Steve Sarkeesian as a coach. You have a fantastic win, and then two of the next three weeks, you just have gut rip like horrible – gut rips open your bowels fall out moments it's just it's so bad that's the sort of thing i remember about arizona state games i mean you know that that great that great 2005 game the 2003 game both of those games were fun because usc didn't play particularly well and then they turned it on a win those games are fun i liked it but it's freaking asu you should always beat asu always so when you lose to ASU, you remember it. When you beat ASU, it's like, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now that you reminded me, I do remember we beat ASU that year. <laughs> Whatever. ASU is garbage. Consistently, they're garbage. And here's what's weird about this. And ASU fans, if you're paying attention, and you're probably not. I don't mean this as an insult. It sounds insulting, but it's not. ASU should be good. They actually have a lot to offer. I mean, when they're okay, they have pretty decent fan support. Uh, there's a growing pool of blue chip recruits in Arizona. They're very close to Southern California. They have no entrance requirements whatsoever. Because and so, uh, what was what was the what was the Simpsons right. episode? You remember the Simpsons episode where Flanders Flanders? I think Flanders sees that Homer's in heaven. And he says he didn't know that it was, it'd be as easy to get into heaven as Arizona State. Look, you should be able to get football players into ASU. There's no reason you guys shouldn't be good. It's crazy that you're always bad whatever you're bad this year i'm gonna watch the game i'm not gonna i'm not gonna be excited by it and i don't want to talk about asu anymore well i think after the bowel comment i think uh, we can move on i will say that um asu i think in the early years of when they came into the uh pacific coast uh pac-10 as it was called then uh i think they were pretty good sc had a hard time beating them but uh you know, kind of went off and on. When they're good, they've been pretty good. I will say this. I was standing at the goal line when that immaculate reception uh, took place, and uh, it was just jaw-dropping to actually stand there and see how poorly it was played. The whole thing, it was, uh, that is my memory. So let's move on. Fans, ever been caught in the last-minute ticket frenzy? The stress, the uncertainty, it's crunch time. You don't need it. But guess what? There's a game-changing solution, and it's called Game Time. Imagine this, effortless ticket buying for all your favorite sports, music, comedy, theater events. No more frantic searches. Game Time is your ultimate ticket buddy. That sounds good to me. Want perks? Well, how about incredible deals on last-minute tickets? 
and a rock solid best price guarantee. Say goodbye to ticket anxiety and hello to the sheer joy of being in the moment. Now, just because the Trojans are on the road for two straight weeks following this week's uh, bye week, if you're planning on going on the road with the Trojans, check out tickets for upcoming away games at ASU, Colorado, Notre Dame, and Cal, respectively, as well as remaining USC home games, Arizona, Utah, Washington, and UCLA. And remember, aside from USC tickets, you can also head to game time for the Dodgers, Angels, Rams, Chargers, tickets to all your favorite L.A. teams, and don't forget the concerts as well. Flash deals, easy access, seat view images, unbeatable best price guarantee, event protection. Game time has it all from sports to rock concerts. So here's the deal. Head to GameTime.co. That's GameTime.co, C-O, not .com. Download the app, create an account, use code TROJANS for $20 off your first purchase. Ready to dive in? As for buying tickets, it's easy as tapping your phone. Tickets are sent straight to your phone. Again, download the Game Time app, create an account, use code TROJANS for $20 off. Terms apply, create an account, redeem code TROJANS, $20 off your first purchase. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right, second quarter, Pac 12 and national rankings. We begin the second quarter of Inside the Trojan Saddle with the following panel. Heading into week four, rank your top six Pac 12 teams in order. Six to one. Give me a brief explanation, Chris. Okay, I'm uh, at number six. I'm coming in with the Utah Utes. I think they're better than this if they have Cam Rising at quarterback, but without him, they're not. We'll talk about that in a bit. I could be wrong. I have UCLA at number five. I guess this week will decide who uh, who gets the number five slot in the all important Chris Arledge Pac-12 rankings. I know people care deeply, uh, but I'm going to go with the Bruins number five. I actually think offensively they're not bad, and their freshman quarterback's pretty talented kid, and will only get better. Um, number Four, I'm going to go with Oregon State. I think Oregon State's a good team. I have, a, I think they have a chance to take over the number three spot um, uh, against uh, against Oregon. But they run, look, they play good defense. They run the ball well. They're well coached. The problem that Oregon State has is compared to the three teams above them, they just don't have the same level of talent. And uh, and I think uh, most of the time, better athletes are going to win you football games. Number three is Oregon. I already said that. Um, Oregon has talent. I'm not sure how well coached they are, to be honest. Uh, I like Bo Nix. Uh, I like their running backs. Uh, and, and I think Oregon believes they're a good football team. And that actually matters. Uh, when, when you run into adversity, I think they're good. They were tested a little bit at Texas Tech. That could be both a good thing and a bad thing. The bad thing is Texas Tech isn't any good. I don't know why you're being tested there. The good thing is that they met the challenge. They're probably the third best team in the conference. I hope the Beavers pass them up. Number two is Washington. Washington uh, Washington on paper has played a better schedule than USC, but I'm not sure they've been really tested any more than USC has. Right, Michigan State, uh, who ordinarily a game at Michigan State would be a pretty good test for a top 10 team. A game you should win, but but you might be challenged a little bit. But Michigan State is just an absolute flaming wreck right now. And so I don't know. I don't know what to make of it. Uh, look, as long as Penix is healthy and they have those receivers, they are going to be able to score points. Uh, and they may be the one team in the conference that on a neutral field would have a would have a fighter's chance of outscoring USC. They're not going to play them on a neutral field, fortunately, but but they would. It's a pretty good football team. Uh, number one is USC. USC hasn't been tested. They played three horrific football teams. They're about to play a fourth. Uh, next week, they'll play a super overrated team. I think we'll talk about them in a bit. Um, but at least the overrated team has a few players. So I don't know what to make of USC other than the fact that I know that offense can score on anybody at any time and will do so all year long. No doubts whatsoever about that. And they, they appear to be uh, good enough on defense that they can occasionally get a stop, which is probably going to be enough to win the conference. So that's my six through one. Very good. Very good. Okay, Mark? All right. So, you know, I stopped listening to Chris, not because I, he wasn't giving anything great to say, but I was trying to put together. So what, kind of, what kind of start to an answer is that, Mark? 
I was trying to put together my top 10 because your first two answers matched up with mine. So I knew we were on the same page. So number now, six. Not now we're not. <laughs> number six, um, I got Utah for the same reasons you do. Number five, UCLA, because of their offense. Number four, I'm throwing in I'm throwing in Oregon behind Oregon State uh, because I like Oregon State's defense a lot better than I like Oregon's. That's the only reason. Uh, Oregon has a better offense. I'm not a huge fan of uh, DJ Ungalele at quarterback. I think he is strictly a game manager, period. Washington, for the reasons Chris mentioned, they are lethal on offense, uh, especially those wide receivers. USC, enough said. All right, enough said. Eric. Yeah, I have the I have the same six, not quite in the same order. And I think it's going to be interesting because I have so I have Oregon State six, Utah five, and, and Utah is is the cam rising issue away from jumping up maybe a couple spots. But guess what? It's it's coming for them. I mean, you, they've got UCLA and then the, the schedule's here. So if he's not gonna come back for some of these big games, they they could be uh in trouble. I have I have UCLA at four. I think they can rush the passer, which can result in some good plays. And I, I think every snap uh, that that freshman quarterback takes, he gets better and better. Um, Oregon three, Washington two, and and USC one. I Washington has been Washington has been really good. I, I think this year again, it, it's they haven't they don't have a big marquee win or anything but they've done everything i mean certainly their their fans their staff their players they have to feel like we've done everything that we've needed to do uh so far in this season so i don't know what that gap is between usc and washington i don't think it's huge and uh like like chris kind of mentioned it's a good thing potentially that that usc gets them at home this year but i it's what's interesting is you've got so we've got Oregon State ahead of Washington State. They have to go to Washington State this weekend. And then that UCLA-Utah thing, those two teams are so different at home and on the road. I, I think, you know, Utah could beat UCLA at home and you still don't maybe know which, which one is better there based on kind of where you get those teams. So it's it's definitely an interesting weekend in the conference coming up here finally. Yeah, that's six, seven, eight spot, Wazoo, Utah, Colorado. It's it's bunched up right in there. It is a deep conference this year. There's no doubt about it. It's the best, it's the best conference. It's the best conference in college football. It's insane to talk about that it's in its last year and that it hasn't been for so long. And it just feels like it's all been building to this and then kind of sand through your fingers and, and it's gone. Yeah, I, I think it's pathetic. I think it's pathetic, disgusting, et cetera, et cetera, that in the last year of the Pac-12, as much as it's been ridiculed for several years now, they are the, at least until proven otherwise, the best uh, conference in the country, which shows you the uh, ineptitude of the people that ran the Pac-12, that they didn't know really what they had. And with the transfer portal, it would only have gotten better, I think, Every quarterback that was pretty good that wanted to change uh, environment, they'd go to the Pac-12, and that's really what separates the Pac-12 from everyone else, in my opinion, is the quarterbacks. All right, um, I went with Utah, number six. That's easily changed if rising plays. Uh, I was impressed with UCLA up to a point. Uh, still, you got a freshman quarterback. You don't know what's going to happen when he goes into the some of the uh, more intense environments of the Pac-12. I actually, uh, just on the surface of it, I put Oregon number four. Um, number three is Oregon State. Uh, I, I'm not and never have been a DJ Ungalele fan, but I think in that system with Jonathan Smith, I think he's got, when I watched them play, I said, you know what, he's got him doing what he should have been doing all along. He's not just the major player. He, you know, Smith knows the Dennis Erickson offense you know, like the back of his hand. Um, I know I'm going to get a lot of anger from this. I'm putting USC number two uh, only because they haven't been tested, really haven't been tested. I was hoping in the next two weeks we would get maybe a little something. Arizona State game is basically an exhibition game at best. Uh, I don't think that Colorado, I think it'll, it'll be a fun environment, et cetera, et cetera. 
We don't know how the fans are going to react so early in the morning, but I'm concerned about SC's defense still on the corners. I saw Washington play Michigan State, and again, the Michigan State team uh, was not world beaters by any stretch of the imagination, but it was. I was so impressed with the offense that Washington's running, and I think their defense uh, is pretty pretty workable. The difference, and I think Chris mentioned it, and I agree totally, the fact that SC gets Washington at home by that time of the season, depending on how SC's doing. Let's face it, if Washington defeats Oregon, Washington's going to come to the Coliseum 8-0, 9-0, uh, and if SC can survive, let's say Notre Dame uh, and U- and Utah, uh, depending on whether ra- Rising plays or not, uh, it could be the game of the year nationally. Nationally, so for the moment, I have Washington uh, number one. Uh, but if I really had my brothers, I'd say one and one A. So we'll see how that goes. So uh, let's turn to the national top ten because there's a lot of controversy and stuff going there. I want to know where your guys' their heads are at. So. Heading into week four, rank your national top 10, 10 to 1. Explanations where needed. Chris, who's your top 10? I actually don't have a problem with the AP's top 10 right now, though I would play around with the order a little bit. Oregon's number 10 in the AP poll. I think that's okay. I, I I might slip Oklahoma into that spot. They haven't been tested by anybody yet. Um, but I but I, I mean, might put them up there for I mean, a little. Are you having trouble hearing me this time? Hello. Greg, it's on you, man. Can you hear me? Yeah. Raise your hand if you can hear me. How's it on me? Okay. You know what, Greg? Just just wait a second. We're gonna get to you or we won't, but I'm gonna I'm gonna finish because they can hear me. Okay. I might put OU at number 10. They haven't played anybody good, but they've been putting up gigantic numbers, and 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 I think their quarterback's pretty good. And I want them to be highly ranked when they choke uh, because that will be fun. Um, number uh, Notre Dame is at number nine. I think that's fair, although I might actually move them up a little bit. I think they're going to – I was going to say I think they'll beat Ohio State, but I think I'm jumping the gun on our predictions. I think Notre Dame is – I think Notre Dame is a pretty good football team this year, especially at home. Washington's number eight. I'd have Washington higher than that. I think Washington would beat Penn State. I think Washington would likely beat Ohio State. I think Washington would have a pretty good chance of beating Florida State at this point. So I think they're probably undervalued at number eight. Uh, But again, because nobody's been tested yet, it's hard to know. Penn State, Ohio State, fine. Both good football teams. I don't trust Penn State. I don't think anybody should trust Penn State. Uh, Once... Penn, if Penn State starts beating good teams, then then I'll pay attention to them. Ohio State finally got the offense on track. They're at number six in the AP poll, fine, but they they still don't look right to me. And we'll see. Maybe it's just new quarterback. They haven't adjusted yet. Um, USC's at number five in the AP poll. I think USC's better than that. Um, I think USC against Florida State on a neutral field. I take the Trojans every day in that matchup. Every single day. Look at it this way. Florida State got all that credit for beating an LSU team. It's probably not all that good. That's a good win, but I'm not sure that LSU is that great. Florida State has a good quarterback, but would you take him over USC's? I don't think there's any way in the world you have. USC has had some struggles over the last few years, but not like Florida State. It's not like they have, it's not like they're Alabama and they have a track record where you know they're going to show up. I don't I think Florida State is overrated at four. I'd put them down about number eight or nine, to be honest with you. Uh, Texas at number three on a neutral field. I think USC could be Texas, but that's a really tough game. I don't trust Steve Sarkeesian, but I actually trust that defensive line of theirs. They look pretty darn good. Uh, Texas has a lot of blue chip talent on that team. That's a good football game. I think USC probably has to score 40 to win that one. I think they might. Michigan at number two. I think Texas and USC are both better than Michigan. I may be wrong about that. Michigan in the last couple of years uh, has really handled Ohio State, which means they know how to deal with teams that can score a lot of points. They're physical. They run the ball. But they've looked like absolute garbage in their first three games. And maybe it's just because they're sleepwalking through a bad schedule. But they look bad. And I don't know what to make of that yet. I don't know if they're – I haven't seen anything to suggest they're the number two team. 
I would put them behind both USC and Texas and probably behind Washington. Georgia at number one, fine. Until they lose, we'll keep them there. They haven't looked great this year. I mean, they look beatable. The, the funny thing about this season is you look at all these top 10 teams and there's not a single one you look at and say, yeah, I don't know. I don't know who's going to beat them. Every single one of them you look at and say, yeah, they could lose. They've got they've got real weaknesses, including USC. Um, I'd keep Georgia number one. And uh, so what does that mean? I guess that means Georgia's one, Texas is two, USC is three, Washington is four, and everybody else is slotted wherever they are in that in that uh, top 10. All right. Well, that was a good uh, dissertation. Uh, Mark? Yeah, so I'm going to start at number 10 with a team from Oregon, but I'm going Oregon State. Uh, if if I, if they're better, if, if I think they're better than Oregon in the Pac-12, I got to be consistent and keep them above them in the uh, in the national circuit as well. Notre Dame, number nine, they they beat Ohio State. We'll see where they how good they look and how they do it. We can slide them up or down. Uh, Penn State, I got Washington at seven. I'm going to leave Ohio State at number six. This is where my top five changes around. So I'm going to put Florida State at number five. Uh, for a lot of for the reasons that, that Chris mentioned, they're they're just they're inconsistent. They needed Boston College to literally implode with I don't know how many penalties they had, but uh, if Boston College just plays smart football, they probably win that game against Florida State. I'm going to put Texas at number four. I think that win over an overrated Alabama team is going to look worse and worse as the season goes on. I think Alabama's going to lose at least three games this year. Uh, the fact that they have no quarterback behind Bryce Young, Nick Saban has no one to blame but himself. I mean, he came out, was it last year or the year before, saying that defense doesn't win championships anymore, essentially, that you need an offense. Well, what are you waiting for? And then you go out and you hire some, you know, 31-year-old, 32-year-old offensive coordinator? It tells me Nick's brain isn't working right. Um, USC at number three. I'm going to leave... Georgia at one, Michigan at two, just because based on the last year, and they haven't done anything this year yet to, to have them drop down. Now, with what Chris was saying, I thoroughly agree. There is no definitive number one team this year. So when you've got 63 number one votes being cast aside and 57 are being given to Georgia, two to Michigan, um, and then what were the other split up between Florida State and Texas? Why not give USC one? If they're in the top five, and we're saying that USC can beat pretty much anybody in that top five on any given day, why not throw them a bone? Why aren't they getting any number one consideration? Because they haven't played anybody? Okay, that's a fair argument. But again, how are we looking at Texas's win over Alabama the way it looks today? Or how are we going to look at it down the road when Alabama's three losses? Is LSU really that good that Florida State deserves all that street cred right now? I don't know. So to me, if we're if we want to say who's number one, Georgia still has the best defense in the country. Find me a better offense than USC's. Makes sense. Eric. It's hard right now because you're still balancing power rankings versus the pull of what you've accomplished this season, right? And so how do you weigh what you think a team can be? versus what they've already done and, and i think in the top 10 right now you've got a mix of of those two things going on uh i think ultimately usc could be about 19 right now and based on that schedule at the end of it they could get all the way up and <laughs> to number one if, if you win all the games i mean that it hasn't been it's it's been a while since usc has had a schedule where it truly was you you lose just one game all the way through and you've got enough really really good wins in there where you don't have to judge it against other teams this schedule does that for usc you you win these games and, and you're going to the playoff but looking at it right now i'm i'm with chris i have oklahoma at 10 again you you can only beat the teams that you play and and they are putting up uh, a ton of numbers against them penn state at nine ohio state eight notre dame at seven i have washington at six and really close with Florida State at five. Again, Florida State, you you have to weigh now. Yeah, they, they beat LSU, and then you had that game 
against Boston College where I under you know you understand there's a look ahead. They've got Clemson coming up now, and that one was kind of sandwiched in there. That that BC game and BC has been terrible this season. Uh, I've got USC at four because yeah, the Texas win against Alabama might look different later in the year. That's going into Alabama and beating an Alabama team that again has Alabama athletes. That defense is good. That that's a win. That's a win that I think carries all the way through this season, even though Alabama is now out of the top 10 for the first time in like 150 years or whatever that number is. I think, I think since 2015, this is the first time they've been out of the top 10, which is ludicrous. Uh, and then I've got Michigan at, at two again, that's weighing that kind of what you expect from them. And they've given up nothing this year, I think single digits in all three games in, in terms of points allowed. So again, you, you're doing what you need to do against the teams on your schedule. And then, I think Georgia's won. I, you know, we're all in agreement. I think you shake up the top, I don't know, seven, eight, 12 teams in there, and you could kind of come up with whoever beats whoever uh, again, which is start thinking about next year, that 12 team playoff, and there's, there's going to be some games in there. Yeah. All right. Um, I'm going to give mine. Yeah. Go ahead, Mark. Oh, I just, I didn't know if you were on freeze frame or not. I was just going to say Alabama's still overrated at 13. So go ahead, Greg. I'm sorry. Um, okay. I'm going to kind of throw stuff against the wall and see if it sticks. Um, until these teams start eliminating each other by playing against each other, we really don't know. But I'm going to go with Oregon State at number 10 until I'm proven wrong. Um, I'll go with Penn State at number nine. Uh, I'm always uncertain about Penn State, but I think they – they're physical. They play hard. Play them at Penn State. It's tough to beat them there. Uh, Texas, I uh, I don't have a lot of faith in Texas, only because um, watching the Boston College game, uh, uh, I don't know. It just seemed like uh, or what was who who did Texas play? Did I get that wrong? Texas. I just beat Wyoming. Texas, Wyoming. Texas, Wyoming. Yeah. Uh, I don't have a lot of uh, confidence in them. Notre Dame, uh, I put seven. Ohio State is six. Um, we're going to find out about this week about where they stand, so that's going to be a face-off. I put Florida State at five. I, oh, Florida State and Boston College, that's the one I was thinking about. I, I was not impressed with Florida State. Uh, great effort by Boston College, but you have all those penalties by Boston College. Uh, take those out, and what do you have? You might have a you know Florida State should lose. I want them to lose. I think they're a fraud. Uh, number four, uh, I have USC, although I could put them up maybe one more, but I just hard for me to justify it. Uh, I have actually have Washington number three. Uh, that may be way too high, but uh, I I don't see a reason why. I think Michigan. I I know Michigan's good. How good? I don't know. And for all the obvious reasons, Georgia's won until someone knocks them off. So it's really kind of a crap shoot in a lot of ways, but we're going to find out shortly uh, by the game. Let's move on here, friends. A reminder, you in a away game, we are SC brings you follow idiot analysis and response from we are editor-in-chief Eric McKenney and columnist Mark Culkin and Greg Katz. The trio uh, answers and discusses five important in-depth questions about the just-concluded game. Uh, we invite you once again to check out five things shortly after the conclusion of Saturday night's Arizona State game from Tempe. All right, halftime. Panel, what are your feelings regarding this Trojan team not being uniform in their uniforms? Example, different colored tights, shoes, colors, different uh, long sleeve shirts, etc. Eric, does it bother you that they're not in a true uniform? No, no. I mean, as long as they're not wearing a, a official black uniform or something that, that looks um, tacky, like, like I think that probably would, even though maybe that ages me about 140 years. Uh, the, the tights, the whatever, that's all, that's all comfort. I understand, you know, you've got, the different stickers and and all of that on the the helmets right now. I, ultimately, I'm I'm okay with that. The different cleats and and uh, 
tights and sleeves and all of that. I, I think that that you got to be comfortable when you're playing. Uh, Chris, what do you think about this uniform deal? You're on mute, Chris. Chris, Chris is taking taking the mantle from Greg. Can we not hear Chris? He's muted. Yeah, he's he's doing he's doing impersonations. All right, let's uh, move on to Mark until we get Chris fixed fixed. So, Mark, can you hear us? Yeah, I'm here. you can hear me, right? <laughs> right, right, right. Okay, good. It's a new position here. We at uh, in the. Huddle. I was actually on mute. Yes, that's what we kept saying. <laughs> I thought it was an internet thing. I I, I got you to blame it on me, service. didn't you, Chris? Chris was getting all excited. I got cats again. Yeah, I, sorry, I, buddy. No, yeah. look, look I, I'm going to go ahead and answer in order. I don't want to lose my second spot, but I'm not going to take very long. I didn't realize there was a uniform issue, Greg, until I read your question. I didn't know that they had different shoes and different. I mean. Look, you're a fashion guru. I'm not, so I didn't pay attention to that sort of thing. But I think they look just fine. What a disappointing answer, Mark. So I'm all about discipline, and I, I think part of that discipline is, yeah, you're you, if you dress like a team, you look like a team. I'm also one of those guys who do not believe that men should be wearing spandex, and if you are, it shouldn't be showing. So as to your tights, I, I think is what I'm, I'm referring to your tights question. Um, okay. Yeah, I don't, I'm not a big fan of seeing gold tights or cardinal tights coming out below the pants from the knee down. Not a fan. I'm with Eric. I do agree. You need to feel comfortable. So if you need to wear that stuff on your arm, you know, the neoprene stuff on your on your elbow or whatever to for extra support, great. Putting on that the spandex pants, don't do that. Not a good look. Not a good look. I wore I wore that I wore that stuff all the time. Now, granted, I played somewhere where it was cold, and if you play where it's cold, you need that. I don't know why you need it when it's ninety, but but uh, you know what? If you're secure in your masculinity, you can put those on, and it's not a problem. And that that's you should probably talk to your therapist about that, Mark. Sorry, I just I I got visions of really large women wearing that stuff and seeing everything I shouldn't need to see. Oh, here we go. <laughs> How special. many YouTube responses are we going to hit? Mark doesn't like large uh, women. I don't think that's true. Talking about spandex specific. That's right. That's right. I'm going to defend Mark on this one. Besides Chris's uh, obviously snarky comment, uh, I, I'm you know I'm old school. I think that a uniform is a uniform. I don't see like watching players have a different color shoes. I that's why they call it a uniform. We think is one. Uh, you know I. I, I think, uh, you know, I, I know it's a bad parallel, but, you know, I, I, I go to Dodger games a lot and they, you know, they traded for Kike Hernandez and what does he do? He shows up at shortstop. I think it was green fluorescent shoes. Well, all the rest of the players are wearing a different. And now, now the other shortstop Rojas was going to wear some shoes and it's just distracting. It doesn't look like a team, uh, especially at the college level. I think it's very important that they all, pretty much look the same uh but maybe i'm out of it it's possible i'm out of it but uh i would prefer a full everybody dresses the same uh type of look uh okay we kind of uh, went through that one a little bit um panel if you had won a college football lottery in which the winner received an all expense paid trip for a college football weekend in 2023 other than a usc game what game would you choose to see and why, Eric? I th I think it's Ohio State, Michigan for me. I, I think that's that's one. Now, if I could kind of split time, it would be the other playoff game, right? So at covering the one that USC's in and then going to to the other one. Um, but but I think I think seeing the the Ohio State Michigan game and and everything around that um would be at LSU Alabama right up there probably as as number two for me I give give my top 10 so that nobody else has anything to say but I'll, I'll stop at those two okay Chris do I have to talk about large women or is that just what you and Mark are going to do whatever floats your boat Chris okay um 
Look, I think I think Eric's right. Ohio State, Michigan uh, would be would be an incredible game. LSU, Alabama would be number two. Uh, I think uh, I think the Iron Bowl would be a great one to watch, also. Um, and and who knows? I might actually be able to pull this off. I'll have to see what time the game is. But I think this year's Texas OU game is going to be a lot of fun. And and those two programs, like any good rivalry, really hate each other. Um, so that would be a fun one too. I, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna go uh, this year. I'm gonna go OU Texas. Okay, Mark. Yeah, since uh, my friends took all the obvious answers, I'm gonna take Oregon State. Oregon. I would love to go to a Civil War game. See what that's all about, especially if it was in Corvallis. And then Army Navy. I got to check that off my bucket list. I, I want to get out there for one of those and just experience that whole pomp and circumstance. The other games that Chris and Eric mentioned, absolutely. I mean, who doesn't want to go see or, you know, Ohio State, Michigan, Alabama, Auburn, Georgia, Alabama, Alabama, LSU, the Red River shootout. Those are all just fun, fun games to want to go check out. Yeah, you know what? The beauty of college football is the tradition and the traditional rivalries. I'm very concerned that some of them are going to go by the wayside, especially after I watch what Fox TV is doing to tradition. They don't seem to really care. They only care about ratings and money. I understand it's a business. But, you know, I my memory of being at Ohio State when SC was there, <laughs> excuse me, with the great Barkley comeback, I'll never forget how intense and loud it was You lost your voice. It was that loud. You'll never Don't forget. Say anything Ever. like that. It's coming out to warm up to the conclusion of the game. It was so, it was, it was unbelievable. My thing is, if that was unbelievable, how much better could Michigan be? Uh, they tell me that the big house has a lot of people, but it isn't always consistent loud. Uh <laughs> If uh, high value comes in there, they tell me Ohio State is consistently loud no matter who they play. But I would like to be at the horseshoe when, when Ohio State plays Michigan. It, I, I can't imagine anything more intense, although I'm not going to dispute that the other rivalries aren't as intense. But they kind of grab my imagination. All right. We again I'm strongly surprised. Encourage Hold on. I, I know. It's like Hang on. I know cool. USC. I know USC plays UCLA on November 18th. I cannot believe nobody picked the Alabama Chattanooga game on on November 18th to get out there oh for that God, one. You could right. do a whole a whole SEC tour of those kind of games that weekend instead of seeing USC UCLA. I think this year's Alabama team beats Chattanooga by at least 13. That's why I didn't put that on my list. Ah, oh, for good reason. Understandable understandable well again we encourage those of you watching inside the trojan subtle on sites like youtube to click the like and red subscriber buttons it's greatly valued appreciate it it's free and you can also listen to inside the trojans huddle on many available podcast sites oh no be sure to check out we become a pre-time folks in honor of usc going to the big 10 in 2024 we kick off the third quarter of Inside the Trojans Huddle with our Big Ten Lightning Round panel. Uh, answer the following statements with a brief comment, if required. We'll go in this order. Mark, Eric, Chris, and myself. Here we go. Question one, yes or no. The temperature at the 7.30 p.m. kickoff at ASU will be above 90 degrees. Yes or no, Mark? Yes, it'll be 92 degrees. Eric? Uh, 90.1 degrees. Chris? Uh, the high that day is supposed to be only 94, so no, it will be 87. I say it'll be below 90. Question two, yes or no, Saturday night's game at ASU will be a sellout. Mark? No. <laughs> All right, got to know. Eric? No, I mean, I get that people show up for USC games. I couldn't. How much money would you have to be paid as an Arizona State fan to go to any Arizona State game at, oh, at this point? So I know people who paid $159 to go to this game. They bought their ticket well in advance, obviously. Chris? 
I don't think it'll be a sellout. If you're if you're an Arizona State fan, you should go. You get to see Caleb Williams. It's the only good thing you'll see all year. I say it will not be a sellout. Question three, yes or no? Caleb Williams will throw for five touchdowns and more than 300 yards in passing offense against ASU. Mark? Yes. Eric? Yeah, I think he has a big one. Chris? I think so, but he only has a half to do it. It's going to be tough. I agree with Chris. It's going to be tough, but I'll say he does it. Question four, yes or no? The Trojans' defensive line will sack ASU quarterbacks at least Three times on Saturday night. Mark? In the first half. Pick your poison. Yes. Eric? Do they have quarterbacks? Like, will quarterbacks take snaps for Arizona State? I mean, who? right? They're going to tackle whoever catches the snap three a times. Wild, yes. A lot of wildcat in that game. Chris? Yeah. It may be Wildcat, or it may just grab a pizza guy off a bicycle, a pizza delivery kid, and throw him out there. And I think they'll sack him like 87 <laughs> times. Yeah, look, they better get three sacks. ASU is going to have to throw the ball all night. They have no offensive line. How could they not get three sacks? Agree. Yes. Question five. Yes or no? Defensive tackle Bear Alexander will be an All-American before he departs for the NFL. Mark? Sure, yes. Eric? Yeah, I think so. It's it's certainly tracking that way at this point. Chris? Agreed, yes. Uh, and I agree, too. Question six, yes or no, the Trojans' defense will hold the ASU offense to under 24 points? Well, they better, yes. I think so, yeah. All right. Jeez, I hope so. All right. <laughs> I think they'll hold them under, under 17 points, so yes. Question seven, tight end Lake McCree will catch three passes on Saturday night. Mark? No. Eric? I think three exactly. Yeah. Chris? I think it has to be three exactly. He said we'll catch three passes. Uh, the last time we had a Lake McCree question, I'm pretty sure I was the only Lake believer in the group, and I'm pretty sure I came out on top. So I'm I'm sorry to see that Mark is still doing what he's doing with uh, with Lake. Yeah, Lake McCree will catch three passes, three passes for 26 yards. Nothing personal, Lake. It's a play calling. Uh, yes, I think he'll catch three passes on Saturday night because I think they're going to want Colorado to be thinking about the SC tight end a little bit. Question eight, Dennis Lynch will kick two field goals on Saturday night. Mark? No. Eric? No, no, no. Chris? No. Uh, I say no. Question nine, take your pick. Regular popcorn or kettle corn? Mark? Kettle corn. Eric? Yeah, of those two, kettle corn. Chicago-style popcorn, though. Okay, Chris? I'm not a popcorn fan, but I'm a sugar fan, so kettle corn. Wait, I'm right. curious. What's what's Chicago style popcorn, Eric? Caramel and cheese mixed. Okay, that's gross. Well, it's not on the same piece. You have a ch like cheddar cheese, right? Popcorn and caramel. But it's in the same mouth. Mix no, them together. I don't, I'm not a fan of that. I it's don't like, like a McDo. Can you keep the cool side cool and the hot side hot? How do you do that? I, look, I don't know what to tell you guys. It's fine. It's more for me. <laughs> This is a question we'll table to the Notre Dame weekender. That's right. Uh, yes, I will take the kettle corn. Question 10, yes or no. Would you pay $75 or more for a parking space to a college football game? Mark? Who's playing? Yes or no. Would you pay $75? Depending on who's playing, yes. Okay. Fair enough. Eric? No, I kind of like the the long walk and decompression time after a game. I, I don't I don't mind taking a walk afterward. Now, there's times where it's two in the morning. Um, but but no, I I, I like all that kind of comes with with that kind of post game decompress. I have paid wow. I have paid seventy five dollars or more many times. So I think I have to answer yes to it. Very, we appreciate your honesty. Well done. Uh, I would pay it to, like Mark. I, it depends on the game and and how desperate I was just to get out of the car and get to the stadium. 
I like being parked close to the stadium. I don't like long walks like Brookside Park if I can help it. All right, bonus question. Fill in the blank. When it comes to buying a car, the car manufacturer I tend to stick with is Mark? America. I have America. Brought up a while. Any specific car manufacturer? You know, okay, you're just an American-made car. Yeah. Uh, Eric? Is there some type of sponsorship that I'm not aware of that we're supposed to plug here? Mercedes-Benz? Like, do, what, do, what do we say? Bugatti? I don't, I don't know <laughs> uh, uh, what what we're supposed to go with that, that gets us in the door on this. But uh, I like the angle. I really do. So I technically I've had a Subaru for how twenty something years at this point. Chris, that would not be an American car, Mark, and I can tell your disappointment. I, I don't drive one, but if I had to buy one, I'm buying American. Okay, there's nothing wrong with that. Of course, nothing wrong. I'm not. What with Subaru or America? Obviously, there's nothing wrong with America, Greg. Nothing wrong with Subaru either. Okay. Hippie. Look, I, I've bought I've bought quite a number of forts over the years, quite by accident, I suppose, because I had a friend that uh, that ran a dealership, and they've been good cars. They haven't broken down on me. And then I went and bought a I bought a I bought a Corvette, and I couldn't get it to start half the time. So I don't know. I think I'll go with Ford, but I'm not really committed. It's not like I, you know, I don't have like a frequent buyer card. I don't, you know, I I don't wear the a Ford T-shirt around. I'm not that motivated, but. Since we're since we're asking this bonus question that nobody cares about the answer to, I guess that's my answer. You're never going to land us a deal with that kind of what an attitude, wishy washy <laughs> attitude. I mean, that's look, trouble, if, Chris. if I start get if I start getting a portion of whatever deals we land, then maybe I'll try harder. Oh, it always has to be a deal with you, doesn't it? I'm yeah, willing. I'm willing to try a try a Tesla around. Let them know how it works. Yeah, I'll, I'll sign up with that Bugatti thing if uh, if they want to. But I'm not sure Bugatti thinks that there are a lot of Bugatti drivers that listen to this show. I'm skeptical myself. Well, we'll find out about that shortly. Um, I, I'm a Toyota Camry person for a long time. My early days was a Ford Pinto. I in the old that's really going back before I realized that. But uh, yeah, Toyota Camry is uh, kind of my my favorite one. So with that, do you guys do you guys love when Greg comes in just? crystal clear on this this kind of stuff it's phenomenal I, what, are you favorite, saying, McKinney? what is your favorite part of this show point? greg you, you, when you started talking you froze up again you don't get to respond because you freeze all the time but the, my favorite part of the show was when greg was frozen but zoom sped up the words really fast to get them out that was awesome it's like a kung fu movie with greg man. we're gonna get so many likes just based on that and we're going to get a whole bunch of comments about Greg getting better internet again. But, oh my uh, gosh! Yeah, it's when you it's when you wait a long time to send the play in, so you can look at the defense, and then the quarterback is frantically clapping, trying to get the the snap to come back to him. That's that's the kind of offense we run here. Well, the only thing that can get me out of this one is the lighting of the torch, and I want people to know I got some new candles. So here we go: the traditional lighting of the WRSC. Coliseum torch, symbolic of what we do at USC home games between the third and fourth quarter where we light the torch. And look how nicely it's burning. Well, we, we don't. I mean, the four of us don't. Well, you know what? Uh, you know, it's always personal. You know what? Maybe, maybe we should ask USC if we can be the official torch lighters at the Coliseum. We could, we could sponsor the torch. That would be it. That'd be we. I mean, we do. We just don't get Sponsor everything for. else, right? everything else and ladies and gentlemen at home i'm sorry see this is more like it i don't i don't know what to tell you and host dylan brazier as (laughs) why are you interrupting me when i'm doing my thing believe Uh, me i'm not uh, dylan brazier as well as friday's four a new four down show with eric mckinney and Greg Katz bringing you the latest info on USC's next opponent. Again, that's a Friday four down show with Eric and myself. So with that, let's get into the fourth quarter predictions panel. The Pac-12 has a full slate of conference games this Saturday. We'll ask you to predict 
the winner from ranked Pac-12 teams and two national games of significance. All right, here we go. Saturday, number 19, Colorado at number 10, Oregon, 12.30 p.m. ABC, Oregon is a 20-and-a-half-point favorite. Chris, who are you picking? I can't tell you how badly I want Colorado to win this game, all right? That's shocking. That's totally shocking. But – there is no way in the world that Colorado wins this game. <laughs> they have a terrible offensive line. They can't play defense. They have a they have a good quarterback, a good running back, and a stud corner slash wide receiver who's not going to play. That is not going to be enough to win at Odson. It will not be close. But go Buffs. I hope you pull it off. All right, Mark. Who do, who do you got? I'm with Chris. You don't need to add anything else to it. It's going to – this. It's going to get ugly. You know, Colorado does not have the depth to play this type of game. And Oregon at home, they're going to do to Colorado what most people anticipated TCU to do to Colorado. We're going to find out how good the Buffaloes are now. It's not going to be pretty. Eric? Yeah, I'm I'm with Chris. I, I really would love to see Colorado win, um, just to set up the the next game, especially when USC goes out there. I think this is where we get a real sense of Deion Sanders as as a head coach. Last year for USC, the thought was like USC is not going to go undefeated, but how do they respond when they when they drop a game? And I think that's where. Lincoln Riley and Caleb Williams and all that leadership like really kicked in that they were able to to keep going after that Utah loss uh, and pick it up. It feels like Colorado is on fumes right now and everyone expected that to kind of happen at some point because while there's some top level talent there, that depth is just not there yet. So if things go south, what does it look like right for that for that program and and can they kind of pick up and and keep moving? But uh Watching that that Colorado State game, it it sure felt like that was everything they had. That, that was everything that, and and you hope if you're a Colorado fan that that doesn't mean for the rest of the season. But uh, that that's they've asked a lot of their top line guys early on in in the season. Have you ever seen a game where a team is called for ten personal foul penalties? Ever. They both came to play like that. I mean, that that was kind of a fight disguised a of, as a football game. A lot of those were illegal blocks. I, it's like they're it's like they were watching Army or something. For it. it was just well, they kept running the same play that where you're not allowed to block like that anymore. And they showed it though. They just they kept calling it block. <laughs> I think when I was a senior at Elsinore High School, I think Norco's middle linebacker had ten personal foul penalties all by himself. He kept tackling. He kept tackling us for losses and then kicking us while we were down. Fantastic football player. He played at BYU. He played for the Raiders. He was an unbelievable football player. Not much of a citizen, from what I can tell. Dion was right. They made a personal ten times. Um, and Norvell should apologize to that whole program, right? I mean, I I assumed that it was just coaching, kind of understanding now, where if you score in overtime to go down one especially on the road in an environment like that you go for two i mean he he took a situation where you can win the game with a two-point conversion and i know hindsight's 2020 but you can win the game with a two-point conversion and he traded that for fourth and goal from the 23 with a chance to have to score on that play and get a two-point conversion just to tie it's one of the worst trades that I can ever remember seeing in terms of a coach. I again, I know that you're talking about it in hindsight, but that was when you take the ball there, you have to know if we score a touchdown here, we're going for two to to win the game. I, I could some of those decisions from Colorado State late, I could not believe. Well, that that pick by the their best wide receiver, that's what put him in that situation. It was just mental mistakes. You know, right now I do I do appreciate that he didn't wear his shades in the uh, post game news conference. It showed me what a great American he was. Uh, I uh, I think that uh, Oregon's going to find out, or excuse me, Colorado's going to find out about Autzen Stadium. If Colorado gets down, it could get really ugly. I don't think 
you can prepare for this if you've never been in it. Uh, same thing might apply to USC down the road, uh, but Colorado uh, is going to find out. I think what's missing here that hasn't been brought up is that Dan that uh, Dan Lanning has made comments about the Oregon program, uh, and they you kind of forgot about those based on the recent developments with Colorado State. But you know, Lanning has made some comments that uh, Dion did not like. Uh, so uh, this will be uh, very interesting, to be honest with you. All right. And he uh, was talking about Colorado's never won anything, right? Which is hilarious yeah. coming from an Oregon coach. Exactly. Exactly. With all their with all their big shiny trophies. Well, it was about Colorado leaving the conference too, and then Oregon packed its bags as quickly as possible to also get out. Yeah, I. It's funny that that hasn't all the stuff you're saying. Of course, is is valid. But it really hasn't been, at least yet, uh, been a point of emphasis, which we, we may hear. We may hear. November, uh, number 22, UCLA at number 11, uh, Utah, 12.30 p.m. on Fox. How come this game is in at 9 in the morning? Utah is a four-and-a-half-point favorite. Chris, who you got? I have the Bruins. Look, Utah is a tough place to play. UCLA has a freshman quarterback. Yeah. Ordinarily, you'd look at that and say – and say that Utah should roll. But the truth is that without Cam Rising, this this Utah offense is legitimately terrible. They scored 24 against Florida. They scored 20 against an awful Baylor team and 31 against Weber State. What are they going to do? They're going to score, they're going to score 24 points against UCLA and win? I don't think so. I think the Bruins win this game. If Cam Rising was there, I would absolutely pick Utah. But without him, Utah has no offense. And I think UCLA will be able to generate 28, 30 points. That'll be enough. So I think I see the Bruins winning this one. All right. You agree, Mark? No, no. Now that Chris didn't make good points, I just, this is one of those games where Utah, they shouldn't win, but they're at home. They'll get up for an LA school. They'll figure out a way to pull this out. They'll have a running back playing wildcat. It'll, that'll run for 150 yards playing quarterback. I, They'll find a way to win this game. Their defense will make a play on the freshman quarterback from UCLA. Something will happen. It'll be weird. Eric? Yeah, UCLA would win this, I think, by 17 at the Rose Bowl, and they're going to lose on a last-second field goal at, at Utah. Um, I, I think Utah, Weber State is nothing, but they've played Florida. They've played Baylor. I think I think this is where UCLA's early season schedule kind of bites them. That That's a big step up going – two rice echoes playing a, a utah team and and utah's got some injury stuff that they've got to kind of figure out or, or cover up starting with that quarterback spot but i think ucla this is this is about that time of year where things start to get real they start to think about going back to school and things fall apart after a good start yeah i i say if uh, cam rising plays and if rant keithy plays uh i'm picking uh, utah I mean, it wouldn't be a shock, would it, if both of them returned against UCLA, keep holding them out until this game? So we're going to find out. Uh, I don't I don't see how uh, more the quarterback at UCLA can be a freshman and handle that uh, environment. Uh, all right, number 14, Oregon State at number 21, Washington State, uh, 4 p.m. on Fox. Oregon State is a two-and-a-half-point favorite. Chris, who are you picking? I'm picking the Beavers, but this, I mean, they're only a two and a half point favorite because this is a real football game. Uh, Washington State's been playing pretty well. They've already been tested. They played, uh, they played Wisconsin and, 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 and handled them. Um, they have a quarterback that can run around and make plays. So I like Oregon State, but I think it's going to be really close. Yeah, so all right. Uh, Mark, if Washington State can make Oregon State one dimensional, make them have to throw the ball, the Cougars will win this game. If you stop that Oregon State's run game, which is Damian Martinez behind a really good offensive line, I don't know if you if Johnson Smith can put the game on DJ shoulders. I, I just think Washington State has enough offensive firepower to make Oregon State have to score with them, even though it's in Corvallis. All right, Eric. I think you're right. I think 
you can beat Oregon State if you stop the run. I, I don't think Washington State can. I trust that quarterback. I trust Cameron Ward more uh, than Oregon State's, but I think that Oregon State offense is is good enough to score enough. I'd feel better about picking Oregon State if it was in Corvallis, but I, I still think they win close. Oh, it's in Pullman. I apologize. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, this is a this is a one we can. Yeah, it's a tough one. I, I'm going to go with Oregon State here. Uh, I think uh, the point spread is probably pretty close. So I'm going to take them. All right. How about Cal at number eight, Washington, 7.30 p.m. ESPN? Washington is a 21 and a half point favorite. Can we all agree on that one? Bloodbath. Bloodbath. Yeah. Washington by a bit. We all agree. More than all a right. bit. Let's move on. All right. Our national picks of the week. Number four, Clemson, 9 a.m., ABC, Florida State, two-and-a-half-point favorite. Chris? So I don't trust Florida State, but Clemson is a mess right now. And one of the great mysteries in, the, in recent college football is how Dabo's program went from arguably the best program in the country to a team that just can't play on one side of the ball. And they can't. I mean, they're terrible offensively. Uh, Everybody thought it was the quarterback. He's gone. The new guy can't play either. Um, Last week, I thought, okay, they scored 48 points. Maybe they're getting things in order. But you look at the stats, they still only had 360 yards offense against an absolute nobody. So Clemson can't play offense. And I don't think they're going to be able to beat Florida State without being able to play offense. So I think Florida State wins it. And I think they probably win it decisively. Um, despite the fact that they looked awful against Boston College. Mark? Yeah, you know, until Dabo Sweeney is ready to embrace the transfer portal, that's that's what you're going to get. He he only wants to, to, to play players that he recruits. Now, whether they're going to be able to get up, whether they can get themselves together enough to beat Florida State, it's going to be a big game. You know, the crowd will be juiced. I think it's going to be a defensive game. I don't know if, if Florida State can handle that environment yet. We'll find out. When they beat LSU, that game was in, what, Orlando, Florida? Now they're actually going into a real hostile environment, and they're not going to be able to depend on the opponent having 11, 12, 13 penalties in the game uh, to get them over the hump. Eric? I just don't think Clemson's that good. I don't trust Florida State at all. It would not surprise me if they turned the ball over five times there and and lost by seventeen. Uh, but I just, I, how do you pick Clemson? I mean, how do you tr- how do you trust Clemson at all? And Mark's right. This is an a, a absolute example of college football right now. A team embracing the transfer portal and a team absolutely doing everything they can not to have anything to do with it. And you can see how fast you can get. How how good you can get very quickly uh, doing that. So I'll take Florida State, but but I don't, I don't love it. I don't love taking taking that Florida State team on the road at all this year. My uh, my heart is with Clemson. My head kind of goes with Florida State, but I'm going to just throw caution to the wind. I'm I'm going to pick Clemson. I think in that environment for one game that Clemson will figure out a way to win it and Florida State will figure out a way to lose it. Uh, so I'm going to go with Clemson. I'm probably wrong, but that's who I want. All right, number six, Ohio State at number nine, Notre Dame, 4.30 p.m. Uh, Pacific time, NBC, Ohio State, three-point favorite. Who are we picking, Chris? I'm going to pick the Irish. Um They did a pretty good job of shutting down an Ohio State offense last year at the Horseshoe that was a much better Ohio State offense. Ohio State scored a lot of points against Western Kentucky last week, but in the first two weeks of the season, they were bad. Now, maybe you look at that and say, well, it took a couple of weeks to adjust. They have a new quarterback, et cetera. I'm just not sure they're that good. I think Notre Dame is pretty good. Um, I think that – I think the Irish can run the ball. I think now with Hartman, they can throw it a little bit. Um, that stadium is going to be nuts uh, this week. That's probably going to be worth at least seven to 10 points right there. I think it's a low scoring game. 
but I'm going to pick the Irish to win it 24-21, something like that. Mark, agree? Yeah, only because I want Notre Dame to be highly ranked when UFC goes in there to knock them off. So for no other reason, that's why I got Notre Dame. Eric? Yeah, I think I'd take Notre Dame even if it was at Ohio State in this one. I, I think I think Notre Dame is solid and big and tough and all of that stuff that, that can give that Ohio State offense problems. Uh, I'm going with the Irish. I think Notre Dame, the big difference will be at quarterback with Sam Hartman. Uh, Notre Dame Stadium is going to be nuts. Uh, I think they're good enough to slug it out with Ohio State. Uh, I think people are worried about uh, too many Ohio State fans being at Notre Dame Stadium, but uh, I think I think the Irish would be just fine. Should be a great game. Looking forward to it. And boy, wouldn't it be great? USC and Notre Dame undefeated uh, in October. Doesn't get any better than that. All right, this one I think is a rhetorical question. Number five, USC. This is our Cardinal and Gold pick. USC at Arizona State, 7.30 p.m. Fox, SC 32.5 point favorite. Are we all agreement this is going to be a route? Yes. I have. I have. Yeah. This is all a right, three-quarter, let's... this is a three-quarter game for me. Because it won't end all until right. 130 Central, and I probably won't be able to stay up that late. Oh no. Yeah, it happens. It happens. Not gonna happen against a good team, but against these guys, when it's 56 to three and Caleb Williams hasn't played in an hour and a half, I'm gonna fall asleep, man. I can't help it. I'm getting old. Well, you are getting how old are you, by the way? Can we ask? I turned I turned 50 in two months. In two months? Yeah. Well, we'll have a special party for you. Two days before the UCLA game. Yeah. So, yeah. Let's, if you let's get send... all of our Oregon followers to send you a happy birthday card. That would be uh, nice. You know, a lot of people say instead of in lieu of presents, you know, make a donation to such and such. I I'm telling the ladies and gentlemen watching us at home to go ahead and send me the present. Just make sure it's inspected by the FBI before you open it. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Overtime. Here we go. Questions from our listeners. Uh, jump right in, guys. Let's get through this. Question one from R.C. Trojan from Rancho Cucamonga, California. <clears throat> Excuse me. Aside from the obvious answer, what is the position group that causes the most concern where injuries or relative lack of depth could derail the season? What is it? Offensive line. Interior. That's it for me. I think Gino Quinones, Quinones was a, a big part of this team to give you that that versatility there to play all three of those spots. And without him, you're you're really, really looking for answers. I, I know we're not talking about right start. We're talking about depth and and that. But uh, I think that that spot's thin right now. You need to find some answers. I would put linebacker right behind that group. You can only probably lose one player out of that group, and then you start really getting concerned about the depth. I think I think the corners are are a potential concern there too. Um, I don't know how well those guys are going to match up with Washington's wideouts, even if the starters are healthy. But if you lose one or two of those guys, I would have I would have very real concerns. And I agree with Chris. I'm concerned about not only the corners. But uh, somewhat of the safeties, but after watching watching Washington's receivers, they are tremendous. Uh, they are on par with SC, believe me. They are really good. Uh, question two from Hank in Boise, Idaho. What do you think of the DJ and the music at games? Oh, we talked about it last week, I think. Um I like some of it. Sometimes it's too loud and sometimes there's too much of it. I would like, like I to said, see it. Like I said, I'm old. I've offered my uh, multiple times. It's they, they got to figure out how to get it in sync. It's almost like the spirit of Troy are just backup dancers right now. That's all they do. Yeah, I'm disappointed in that. I think that's a good point. I think the band needs to be put in behind the Trojan bench within the student body. <clears throat> maybe it's more difficult when you have tubas and trombones and maybe there's more leg room. Uh, behind the end zone, but they seem so distant and they seem secondary to the DJ. I agree that it needs to be refined. Uh, all right, question three from uh, Jerry in Mission Viejo, California. What happens if center Just Justin Dietrich goes down? Who plays center? 
I mean, I'm kind of curious how much they trust Killian O'Connor. He's come in as as the number two center with Gino going down. I don't know. I don't know for sure if that would be the case if it's on the second drive in South Bend. I I, I would assume not. I think you've got a couple guys who can shift inside. I think Jonah Monheim becomes a, a potential guy there. Jared Kingston is a potential there. I think now that you've got Mason Murphy as kind of your your clear number six and he's a tackle, I think Jonah coming in either to guard and Kingston slides over or all the way into center and and uh, Murphy is in either at, at left tackle or right tackle with Tarquin switching over. Uh, I think I think that's probably probably where you're going to end up going if you have to go to a number two center. For short short period of time, Killian is your number two guy. Anything extended, Eric nailed it. There's no reason to to go on. All right, question four from Steve in Oxnard, California. Panel, what game scares you the most? Notre Dame, Washington, or Oregon? All of those games scare me a lot, actually. I mean, those are I mean UCLA UCLA will be a challenge. Utah could be if rising comes back, but those are the three. And of the three, Oregon is the least of the three teams, I think, but also the also the biggest challenge, just because USC will have played such a brutal schedule before they get to Autzen. Um Yeah, the game, I think the matchup, the team is is that Washington passing attack. That that Washington passing attack, I think, of all of the the different units and and things in those matchups, I think that is the the best and kind of matches up for for them the best against USC's defense and watching them kind of go up and down the field now USC always has the ace right that they, they can always just put their offense back out on the field and, and things should go pretty well against any of those teams but uh I think I think it's a good year I think I already mentioned it but getting Washington at home uh is nice but that the way the schedule lines up that that trip to Oregon is is going to be tricky I think Oregon is probably maybe maybe by a wide margin the the third team in that group if you if you rank them there but schedule's tough the way that works out in order Notre Dame Oregon Washington all right my opinion in order Notre Dame Washington Oregon Notre Dame right now number one because they're the first game up of that trio it's going to be really, really challenging. Question five from Will in Altadena, California. Panel with the quarterbacks we're going to be facing in the near future. I'm concerned with the Trojan corners. Are you? I think we kind of touched on this, right? Uh, I think we are concerned about it. Any other comments? Well, you're concerned about every spot, right? I mean, the defense has has looked good, but they haven't played. I mean, literally have not played a good offense. I mean, San Jose States was passable for this level. Nevada's offense is not good. Stanford's offense is terrible. The way Arizona State's offense is shaping up is not good. Shadur Sanders is a very good quarterback. He is super talented. They've got some wide receivers. That offensive line is not going to challenge any defense with a pulse. The the concerns are everywhere because I don't know if you're going to get a real answer until they go to to Notre Dame. So you're you're kind of hoping that things look good and again it does seem that way, right? You're tracking positively I I think uh in terms of everything, but yeah, the corners the corners are are certainly a spot in there where you want to see them make more plays. You want to knock more balls down, you want to get your hands on on more stuff. You want to be, you know, in position and then finish the play a little bit more than what they've done so far. And you just know those guys are going to be challenged against so many. There's so many good quarterbacks, so many good offenses, and and you and you're running a defensive scheme where those guys are going to be by themselves a lot. I mean, it's just it puts a, a huge burden on them. It almost doesn't matter who you at. You can take past USC corners who are great players and stick them out there this year, and I'd still be concerned going into that Washington game, for example. I mean, it, that's a really good offense with a great quarterback and great receivers. And you're going to play man on man most of the game. So yeah, I'm worried about those guys, and, and and not because I think they're bad players. I think they're I think they're decent players who are getting better. 
It may turn out to be pretty good by the end of the year, but still, they have just some huge challenges coming up. I think it, I think it depends on how strong USC's defensive line continues to get, because if they're if they're putting pressure on the quarterback, that's just less time that USC's corners have to defend in that one on one on an island situation. So again, they play hand in hand together. Uh, I wanted to ask Chris this question because somebody asked me the question. I don't know why, but I told him I would ask Chris for them. If the transfer portal was around when you were playing, Chris, would you have used it, and where would you have gone? I I don't know why anyone would care about where I would have gone. I was surprised. I did transfer. I did transfer. My first season, I played at Occidental College, and then I transferred to to William Jewell after my freshman year. So I was, uh, in many ways, I was the start of this whole thing. I think people yes. saw what I did. People forget about that. Yeah, I was like the Kurt Flood of college football in many respects. People saw my trailblazing activities and said, you know what, I think that's where the game is going. And look, yeah, I think you're going to be uh, probably a first ballot all transfer in the Hall of Fame, the transfer Hall of Fame. It's hard to imagine it hasn't happened already. Well, it's really kind of disgusting that it hasn't happened, to be honest with you. Um, all right, uh, question six from B. Davis. 7-Eleven from Irvine, California. This will be our last question. Who is the panel rooting for in this week's upcoming matchup between, now he spells it W-H-O-R-E-G-O-N and the CU Fighting nice. and, Well, it's not, but we're, the truth hurts. And the CU Fighting Dions. I think we're all in agreement on that, that do we think that the uh, uh, W-H-O-R-E-G-O-N is going to win it? Well, he's asking who we're rooting for, not who we think is. I mean, I'm going to be rooting like crazy for prime time. I'm a big, I'm a big coach prime fan this Saturday, but it's not going to help. Well, this is good because it transitions really into uh, B. Davis's second question. He says, "He says I'm torn because I hate Oregon, not maybe not as much as Chris, but I also think that CU needs a reality check." I also don't want Oregon to get the bump from beating a ranked CU team before us. Comment? First of all, I'm not sure that's how you pronounce that word, Greg. And second... <laughs> oh, it's supposed to be Horrigan? It's okay. Maybe, you know, you pointed that. I didn't even realize that. Horrigan. Very good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, Horrigan is what he's saying, and that's why it's me. But and I don't know that I don't know that CU has to get a reality check this Saturday, although I think they're in for one because they're gonna get one the week after that. They've been they've been getting their reality checks. They've just been able to slip through without feeling it. Yeah. Well, you'd expect that from Horrigan, right? Yeah, there you go. There we go. All right. Reminder again, if you have a question or comment for our panel, go to the We RSC members message board. Click on the thread that pertains to Inside the Trojan Settle, viewer or listener questions. And once again, if you've enjoyed Inside the Trojan Settle, please click on the like and red subscriber buttons. We greatly appreciate your support. Be sure to check out wrsc.com and become a premium subscriber. That'll do it for this Tuesday's edition of Inside the Trojan Settle. Reminder to watch five things on YouTube shortly after uh, Saturday night's game at Arizona State. Mark, myself, and uh, Eric, our moderator, We'll go over the game, uh, and that'll probably be a, uh, probably a little bit more than an hour after the game. So uh, check period periodically if you're up that late. So until next Tuesday when we review the uh, Arizona State game, preview Colorado, a new Big Ten lightning round, and all the things USC related. Big thank you to our panelists, Mark Culkin, Eric McKenney, Chris Arledge. Special thank you to all of you for your watching or listening to Inside the Trojan Huddle. Have yourself a great week. Beat the Sun Devils. And until next Tuesday, this is your moderator, Greg Katz, reminding you all to fight on, everybody.